Book Six, Part Four of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Republic by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Six, Part Four. What he said, is there a knowledge still higher than this, higher than justice and the other virtues? Yes, I said, there is. And of the virtues, too, we must behold not the outline merely, as at present. Nothing short of the most finished picture should satisfy us. When little things are elaborated with an infinity of pains, in order that they may appear in their full beauty and utmost clearness, how ridiculous that we should not think the highest truths worthy of attaining the highest accuracy! A right noble thought! But do you suppose that we shall refrain from asking you what is this highest knowledge? Nay, I said, ask if you will, but I am certain that you have heard the answer many times, and now you either do not understand me, or, as I rather think, you are disposed to be troublesome. For you have often been told that the idea of good is the highest knowledge, and that all other things become useful and advantageous only by their use of this. You can hardly be ignorant that of this I was about to speak, concerning which, as you have often heard me say, we know so little, and, without which, any other knowledge or possession of any kind will profit us nothing. Do you think that the possession of all other things is of any value if we do not possess the good, or the knowledge of all other things if we have no knowledge of beauty and goodness? Assuredly not. You are further aware that most people affirm pleasure to be the good, but the finer sort of wits say it is knowledge. Yes. And you are aware, too, that the latter cannot explain what they mean by knowledge, but are obliged, after all, to say knowledge of the good. How ridiculous! Yes, I said, that they should begin by reproaching us with our ignorance of the good, and then presume our knowledge of it. For the good they define to be knowledge of the good, just as if we understood them when they used the term good. This is, of course, ridiculous. Most true, he said. And those who make pleasure their good are in equal perplexity, for they are compelled to admit that there are bad pleasures as well as good. Certainly. And therefore to acknowledge that bad and good are the same. True. There can be no doubt about the numerous difficulties in which this question is involved. There can be none. Further, do we not see that many are willing to do, or to have, or to seem to be what is just and honourable without the reality? But no one is satisfied with the appearance of good. The reality is what they seek. In the case of the good, appearance is despised by every one. Very true, he said. Of this, then, which every soul of man pursues and makes the end of all his actions, having a presentiment that there is such an end, and yet hesitating, because neither knowing the nature nor having the same assurance of this as of other things, and therefore losing whatever good there is in other things, of a principle such and so great as this ought the best man in our state, to whom everything is entrusted, to be in the darkness of ignorance. Certainly not, he said. I am sure, I said, that he who does not know how the beautiful and the just are likewise good will be but a sorry guardian of them, and I suspect that no one who is ignorant of the good will have a true knowledge of them. That, he said, is a shrewd suspicion of yours. And if we only have a guardian who has this knowledge, our state will be perfectly ordered. Of course, he replied but I wish that you would tell me whether you conceive this supreme principle of the good to be knowledge or pleasure, or different from either. I, I said, I knew all along that a fastidious gentleman like you would not be contented with the thoughts of other people about these matters. True, Socrates, but I must say that one who like you has passed a lifetime in the study of philosophy should not be always repeating the opinions of others and never telling his own. Well, 
but has any one a right to say positively what he does not know not he said with the assurance of positive certainty he has no right to do that but he may say what he thinks as a matter of opinion and do you not know i said that all mere opinions are bad and the best of them blind you would not deny that those who have any true notion without intelligence are only like blind men who feel their way along the road very true and do you wish to behold what is blind and crooked and base when others will tell you of brightness and beauty still i must implore you socrates said glaucon not to turn away just as you are reaching the goal if you will only give such an explanation of the good as you have already given of justice and temperance and the other virtues we shall be satisfied yes my friend and i shall be at least equally satisfied but i cannot help fearing that i shall fail and that my indiscreet zeal will bring ridicule upon me no sweet sirs let us not at present ask what is the actual nature of the good for to reach what is now in my thoughts would be an effort too great for me but of the child of the good who is likest him i would fain speak if i could be sure that you wish to hear otherwise not by all means he said tell us about the child and you shall remain in our debt for the account of the parent i do indeed wish i replied that i could pay and you receive the account of the parent and not as now of the offspring only take however this letter by way of interest and at the same time have a care that i do not render a false account although i have no intention of deceiving you yes we will take all the care that we can proceed yes i said but i must first come to an understanding with you and remind you of what i have mentioned in the course of this discussion and at many other times what the old story that there is a many beautiful and a many good and so of other things which we describe and define to all of them the term many is applied true he said and there is an absolute beauty and an absolute good and of other things to which the term many is applied there is an absolute for they may be brought under a single idea which is called the essence of each very true the many as we say are seen but not known and the ideas are known but not seen exactly and what is the organ with which we see the visible things the sight he said and with the hearing i said we hear and with the other senses perceive the other objects of sense true but have you remarked that sight is by far the most costly and complex piece of workmanship which the artificer of the senses ever contrived no i never have he said then reflect has the ear or voice need of any third or additional nature in order that the one may be able to hear and the other to be heard nothing of the sort no indeed i replied and the same is true of most if not all the other senses you would not say that any of them require such an addition certainly not but you see that without the addition of some other nature there is no seeing or being seen how do you mean sight being as i conceive in the eyes and he who has eyes wanting to see colour being also present in them still unless there be a third nature specially adapted to the purpose the owner of the eyes will see nothing and the colours will be invisible of what nature are you speaking of that which you term light i replied true he said noble then is the bond which links together sight and visibility and great beyond other bonds by no small difference of nature for light is their bond and light is no ignoble thing nay he said the reverse of ignoble and which i said of the gods in heaven would you say was the lord of this element whose is that light which makes the eye to see perfectly and the visible to appear you mean the sun as you and all mankind say may not the relation of sight to this deity be described as follows how neither sight 
nor the eye in which sight resides is the sun? No. Yet of all the organs of sense, the eye is the most like the sun. By far the most like. And the power which the eye possesses is a sort of effluence which is dispensed from the sun. Exactly. Then the sun is not sight, but the author of sight who is recognized by sight. True, he said. And this is he whom I call the child of the good, whom the good begat in his own likeness, to be in the visible world, in relation to sight and the things of sight, what the good is in the intellectual world in relation to mind and the things of mind. Will you be a little more explicit, he said. Why, you know, I said, that the eyes, when a person directs them towards objects on which the light of day is no longer shining, but the moon and stars only, see dimly and are nearly blind. They seem to have no clearness of vision in them. Very true. But when they are directed towards objects on which the sun shines, they see clearly, and there is sight in them. Certainly. And the soul is like the eye. When resting upon that on which truth and being shine, the soul perceives and understands and is radiant with intelligence. But when turned towards the twilight of becoming and perishing, then she has opinion only, and goes blinking about, and is first of one opinion, and then of another, and seems to have no intelligence. Just so. Now, that which imparts truth to the known, and the power of knowing to the knower, is what I would have you term the idea of good and this you will deem to be the cause of science, and of truth, in so far as the latter becomes the subject of knowledge. Beautiful, too, as are both truth and knowledge. You will be right in esteeming this other nature as more beautiful than either. And, as in the previous instance light and sight may be truly said to be like the sun, and yet not to be the sun, so in this other sphere science and truth may be deemed to be like the good, but not the good. The good has a place of honour yet higher. What a wonder of beauty that must be, he said, which is the author of science and truth, and yet surpasses them in beauty, for you surely cannot mean to say that pleasure is the good. God forbid, I replied, but may I ask you to consider the image in another point of view? In what point of view? You would say, would you not, that the sun is not only the author of visibility in all visible things, but of generation and nourishment and growth, though he himself is not generation? Certainly. In like manner, the good may be said to be not only the author of knowledge to all things known, but of their being and essence, and yet the good is not essence, but far exceeds essence in dignity and power. Glaucon said, with a ludicrous earnestness, "'By the light of heaven! How amazing!' "'Yes,' I said, "'and the exaggeration may be set down to you, "'for you made me utter my fancies.' "'And pray continue to utter them. "'At any rate, let us hear if there is anything more to be said "'about the similitude of the sun.' "'Yes,' I said, "'there is a great deal more.' "'Then omit nothing, however slight.' I will do my best, I said, but I should think that a great deal will have to be omitted. I hope not, he said. You have to imagine, then, that there are two ruling powers, and that one of them is set over the intellectual world, the other over the visible. I do not say heaven, lest you should fancy that I am playing upon the name. May I suppose that you have this distinction of the visible and intelligible fixed in your mind? I have. Now take a line which has been cut into two unequal parts, and divide each of them again in the same proportion, and suppose the two main divisions to answer, one to the visible and the other to the intelligible, and then compare the subdivisions in respect of their clearness and want of clearness, and you will find that the first section in the sphere of the visible consists of images, and by images I mean in the first place shadows, and in the second place reflections in water and in solid smooth and polished bodies and the like do you understand 
Yes, I understand. Imagine now the other section, of which this is only the resemblance, to include the animals which we see, and everything that grows or is made. Very good. Would you not admit that both the sections of this division have different degrees of truth, and that the copy is to the original, as the sphere of opinion is to the sphere of knowledge? Most undoubtedly. Next proceed to consider the manner in which the sphere of the intellectual is to be divided. In what manner? Thus, there are two subdivisions, in the lower of which the soul uses the figures given by the former division as images. The inquiry can only be hypothetical, and instead of going upwards to a principle, descends to the other end. In the higher of the two, the soul passes out of hypotheses and goes up to a principle which is above hypotheses, making no use of images as in the former case, but proceeding only in and through the ideas themselves. "'I do not quite understand your meaning,' he said. "'Then I will try again. You will understand me better when I have made some preliminary remarks. You are aware that students of geometry, arithmetic, and the kindred sciences assume the odd and the even, and the figures and three kinds of angles, and the like, in their several branches of science. These are their hypotheses, which they and everybody are supposed to know, and therefore they do not deign to give any account of them, either to themselves or others, but they begin with them, and go on until they arrive at last, and in a consistent manner, at their conclusion. Yes, he said, I know. And do you not know also that although they make use of the visible forms and reasons about them, they are thinking not of these, but of the ideals which they resemble, not of the figures which they draw, but of the absolute square and the absolute diameter, and so on, the forms which they draw or make, and which have shadows and reflection in water of their own, are converted by them into images, but they are really seeking to behold the things themselves, which can only be seen with the eye of the mind. That is true. And of this kind I spoke as the intelligible, although in the search after it the soul is compelled to use hypotheses, not ascending to a first principle, because she is unable to rise above the region of hypothesis, but employing the objects of which the shadows below are resemblances in their turn as images, they having in relation to the shadows and reflections of them a greater distinctness, and therefore a higher value. I understand, he said, that you are speaking of the province of geometry and the sister arts. And when I speak of the other division of the intelligible, you will understand me to speak of that other sort of knowledge, which reason herself attains by the power of dialectic, using the hypotheses not as first principles, but only as hypotheses, that is to say, as steps and points of departure into a world which is above hypotheses in order that she may soar beyond them to the first principle of the whole, and clinging to this and then to that which depends on this, by successive steps, she descends again without the aid of any sensible object, from ideas, through ideas, and in ideas she ends. "'I understand you,' he replied. "'Not perfectly, for you seem to me to be describing a task which is really tremendous, but, at any rate, I understand you to say that knowledge and being, which the science of dialectic contemplates, are clearer than the notions of the arts, as they are termed, which proceed from hypotheses only. These are also contemplated by the understanding, and not by the senses. Yet, because they start from hypotheses, and do not ascend to a principle, those who contemplate them appear to you not to exercise the higher reason upon them, although when a first principle is added to them, they are cognizable, by the higher reason. And the habit which is concerned with geometry and the cognate sciences, I suppose that you would term understanding, and not reason, as being intermediate between opinion and reason. You have quite conceived my meaning, I said. And now, corresponding to these four divisions, let there be four faculties in the soul, reason answering to the highest, understanding to the second, faith or conviction to the third, and perception of shadows to the last, and let there be a scale of them, 
and let us suppose that the several faculties have clearness in the same degree that their objects have truth. I understand, he replied, and give my assent, and accept your arrangement. End of Book Six